Hey everybody, welcome back to World History. This is our last section of notes for this chapter, so your notes will be due after uh, this video. Our bell ringer today is what was life like in the factories. We'll do section four notes and quiz. Uh, there should be a video for y'all to watch. Then you're going to work on your review guides. We'll take the chapter 19 vocab quiz. And if you're in the honors course, you're going to keep working on your research paper. Um, our learning objective today is to analyze new ideas that are being presented about the economy and society. So a little bit of a review because we've talked about Adam Smith and laissez-faire a couple chapters ago. Um, laissez-faire is a government should not interfere in business. Again, Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations talking about the idea of free market that's supposed to be there to help everyone, that there should be more goods out there at lower prices, and that this directly reflects the success of the Industrial Revolution. Now, Thomas Malthus, on the other hand, still a laissez-faire economist, he kind of looks at, like, he's a negative Nancy, really. He sees, well, and he thought the population would outgrow the food supply and that the poor would suffer even further. Well, he was wrong. Um, the food supply has actually grown even faster than the population, at least in this point. Um, talking about 2024, he's more right about today than he was back in the time that he originally wrote these ideas. Uh, David Ricardo, also another laissez-faire economist, talked about the iron law of wages. Basically, the idea that there was little hope for the working classes to escape poverty and that a wage increase typically meant there'd be an increase in children being born because, well, you have money, you can have more kids. The same thing is true today. Um, families that tend to have more wealth tend to have more children. So overall, some beliefs of the laissez-faire economists, um, they opposed government help. They wanted laws of the free market to help everybody. They wanted people to be thrifty, focus on hard work, and they wanted to limit family size because they believed, well, if the family gets too big, then that family can no longer support itself and then it becomes a burden on the state. So some modifications to laissez-faire are going to be made, and this is where we get utilitarianism uh, and Jeremy Bentham. This is the idea that the goal of society should be the greatest happiness for the greatest number of citizens. And it's the idea that do laws provide more pleasure than pain, as well as like individual freedoms. Um, so the big thing with utilitarianism is they wanted an extremely limited government with very few laws to make sure, well, people could do what they wanted to do. Uh, John Stuart Mill, another utilitarian, thought that government could improve the hard lives of the working class and that middle class happiness should not harm the working classes. Basically, the idea that any and all benefits that these upper classes are having should not influence the lower classes. He also called for expanded voting rights, not something we're really going to see too much in this era, but like eventually. So from this, socialism is then going to emerge. Um, the Enlightenment beliefs of goodness of human nature and concern for social justice will lead to the idea of socialism, where people as a whole, rather than private individuals, own and operate the means of production. These are farms, factories, railways, and other large businesses that produce and distribute goods. So technically, there's two definitions in that one definition. So again, if you remember back to our very first chapter, we talked about utopias. Robert Owen is going to set up a model society in Scotland attempting to be a utopian. Um, he was a successful mill owner at the time. He was against child labor, and he was very pro-labor union. But again, if you remember back to chapter 13, I said utopias look great on paper, but in reality they do not work. They do not solve all of society's problems. The same is true here with Owen's community in Scotland. So from here, we start to transition into more like thought-based stuff. Karl Marx, a German philosopher um, who utilized the idea of scientific socialism and with his buddy Frederick Engels, is going to write the Communist Manifesto in 1848. To provide a definition, communism is a form of socialism where there's a struggle between social classes that would eventually lead to a classless society where all means of production would be owned by the community. He also went on to say that economics drives history. I mean, think about it. Every chapter we've talked about so far, we've talked about economics in some form. In chapter 13, we talked about patrons supporting the arts. 14 and 15, we talked about European powers uh, wanting gold, mercantilism, tariffs. Chapter 17, we talked about how the Enlightenment impacted, uh, impacted the economy. Last chapter, we talked about how Napoleon and the French Revolution reformed Europe's economy. And now here we're talking about more economics. 
He also identified this struggle between the haves or the bourgeois and the have-nots or the proletariat working class. He called for the power to the workers, and his main goal was to end, commun excuse me, end capitalism and create a classless society. Now, to talk about Marxism in the future, it's going to briefly flourish. Um, in Germany, an idea known as social democracy is going to take place. This is a political ideology in which there is a gradual transition from capitalism to socialism instead of a violent one that Marx was calling for. And of course, our best example is going to be Russia. Uh, we'll talk about this next semester. But the Russian Revolution of 1917 became, well, it essentially transformed Russia into the world's first communist country. Now, over time, flaws are going to emerge. Um, and people's ideas of nationalism versus class loyalty are going to be a very strong. They're going to be more loyal to their nation than their social class. And most economies include elements of capitalism. There's just no way of avoiding it. While Marx's ideas, again, like the idea of a utopia, look great on paper, in reality, they just simply do not work. All right. That is it for notes for today. Um, what you're going to go do is work on your review guide and prepare for the vocab quiz. Honors kids, you have your uh, research paper to be working on. I'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody.